chief of staff to the CEO of Project Health, which is a social enterprise in the area that I uh, made reference to earlier on. It's a very special organization, and Sonia will tell you among other things about an award um, that it received uh, just today, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, let me just uh, repeat what I had said earlier about what a social enterprise is. And typically what it is is an organization operating in the social space with a something other than a, a profit first agenda that is typically applying many of the techniques and practices and strategies more commonly associated with the world of business, the private sector, in order to be maximally effective. So the whole point of it is to have maximum impact in affecting change in an area that's of importance to uh, the members of the organization. And the ingeniousness of the Project Health model is that they're doing two things at the same time, killing two birds with one stone, if you will. On the one hand, they're having great impact on the issue that they care most about, that being bringing health care to underserved communities in a novel way, in an enterprising way. But on the other hand, the other bird they're killing, so to speak, is their model entails the leadership development of a whole core of volunteers who get involved with their organization. And so they're not only addressing the substantive issue of interest, but also developing this whole new cadre of leaders, which is really an amazing accomplishment. And Sonia is a pivotal person in this whole enterprise. And what's amazing is that she is only two years out of college uh, as a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, uh, and now has this highly influential role in this important organization. Sonia Sarko. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. It's really an honor. I was taking a look at the programming that you guys are going through this week. And just to be amongst this group of incredible leaders and incredible um, experts in their field is it's a huge goal for me. And um, actually, the reason that I'm particularly excited to be here today is I just came um, from a ceremony at the State House, and um, there were a number of nonprofits that were being nominated for excellence in the field. And uh, my boss, Rebecca Oni, who I'll talk about in a little bit, um, called me this morning at 6 30 in the morning, which is pretty typical of the position, and said, Sonia, I really need you to go to this ceremony. The governor will be there. It'll be great. You look better in pictures than I do, and you know you can go and represent the organization. So I'm really excited to share with you guys. You guys are the first people to know about this award or see it um, that we won um, in the state of Massachusetts, the 2010 Nonprofit Innovation Award. I also heard that you guys. Um, world David Ortiz, so that makes me even more excited because I expect lots of really awesome questions as well. So question and answer is always my favorite. But um, I wanted to start off by just telling you guys a little bit about myself and how I came to join Project Health and just what a really extraordinary uh, opportunity Project Health has been for me, um, both in my personal development but also in my professional development. And um, I you know, I was born in the Bay Area in California, but have lived for the past 12 years in Austin, Texas, and now live here in Massachusetts. So I think I've sort of covered all of the states um, that you guys are representing today. But when I was at my senior year of high school, I was convinced that I wanted to be a biomedical engineer, despite the fact that I was terrible at physics and knew nothing about it. Um, and ended up at Johns Hopkins University um, actually um, as a public health major. I loved public health because it's a combination of serving your community, thinking about how healthcare affects populations rather than just the individual, and has a lot to do with how you communicate with others, right? So having an effective um, healthcare plan is all about speaking with the constituents who are actually acting out that healthcare. Um, but I found myself in my sophomore year at Johns Hopkins and was just a little bit disillusioned with what I was experiencing at the school, which was I was sitting in class learning about all of these amazing theories and all of these amazing practices, and I had great professors, but I wasn't really able to practice anything out in the community. I was living um, in Baltimore, which has some of the poorest health outcomes in the country and even in the world, 
despite the fact that John Hopkins, of course, is the um, number one health system in the country and is right there in the middle of the city. And I was really concerned about wanting to actually speak to families in the community and not be sheltered inside a little bubble that was the university campus. Um, so in August, right, right before my sophomore year of college, um, Project Health at the time was working with um, Josh Sharfstein, who is the Baltimore City Health Commissioner and is now Deputy Commissioner at the FDA, so he's a rock star. Um, Josh was looking for some students to really spearhead the Baltimore founding of Project Health. And um, just to give you guys some background on Project Health, so uh, my boss, the CEO of Project Health, Rebecca Oni, when she was a freshman here at Harvard as an undergrad, she was interning at Greater Boston Legal Services. And time after time, families would come in and they would either be on the verge of being evicted from their homes or they would have um, these huge legal disputes with landlords that were bankrupting them. And she would say, you know, if you don't pay your rent, then you will be evicted. So what's going on? And families would say, well, I'm having to choose between paying my rent or paying for my HIV medication. Or one mom who came in and said to her, you know, every day my daughter wakes up covered in cockroaches. And cockroaches are a huge trigger of asthma. And Rebecca was really frustrated with the fact that she was having to intervene so downstream. By the time the families came into the offices, they were literally in crisis. And um, you know, every time she sifted to figure out what was going on with all of these health crises, she found that there was some sort of social factor that was impacting the health of these families. Um, so six months later, she was reading an article in the Boston Globe um, about a pediatrician named Barry Zuckerman. And Barry had this revolutionary idea that his pediatrics department should actually be a place where kids got healthy, um, which at the time you know, seemed pretty obvious but wasn't actually happening that often. So Barry had assembled this dream team of, um, of lawyers, of case managers, of mental health um, professionals, of therapists, and had brought them all into the clinic so that when families came in to the pediatrics clinic at the Boston Medical Center, they had everything they needed right there in the clinic. They did not have to worry about transportation. They didn't have to worry about childcare for the children who were staying at home. Everything was right there for them uh, to access. And um, Rebecca liked his idea, but thought that there was a role that young people could play in this as well. So, um, you know, at 18 years old, she called up Dr. Zuckerman, and uh, you know, it was one of those calls where she was like desperately hoping it would go to voicemail because she had no idea what she was actually going to say. And um, of course, his assistant picked up and was like, "Of course, Dr. Barry Zuckerman is right here. He'll talk to you right now." And um, so she sort of stumbles through this congratulations to him. And he's like, "You're 18. Why are you congratulating me? Who are you?" And I finally told him that she thought that there was a, a role that young people could play. And he said, fine, come down to the waiting room, talk to families, and talk to doctors for six months, and then get back to me and tell me what you find. So Rebecca thought this was like the coolest thing ever. She had just been given free license to go and speak to families in the waiting room. And um, so she had all of these harrowing conversations with doctors where we sh she would say, you know, in a world of unlimited resources, which sounds crazy because healthcare is all about the money. And it's all about where you can actually get money for the services. She said, forget all that. In a world of unlimited resources, what would you give your parents? And what she heard over and over again from doctors was, you know, the real issue is that I prescribe antibiotics for a family, but they don't have any food at home to take the antibiotics with. Or I just prescribed an inhaler for this child, but the real issue is that the family is living in a car, not that the family needs an inhaler. And um, you know, she, she heard over and over from doctors, they would say everything from, you know, I don't even ask those questions about food, about utilities, about housing, because I if I find out that the family has a need, I have no idea what to do about it. Um, to other doctors who would say, yeah, in those cases, I just pull a $20 bill out of my pocket and give it to the families. And you know, Rebecca and many of us who have come afterwards um, had or have no formal public health training or no formal medical training, but she realized that this wasn't a system. It was chaos, right? It was each um, individual doctor reacting to the problems that they were seeing. Um, so she decided in 1996, she was a sophomore um, in college, to start Project Health. And Project Health started off literally as a car table in the waiting room. They put out a sign that said, we can help connect you to food stamps, to housing assistance, to utilities vouchers, to childcare. 
Um, and from the very first moment, they were literally inundated. It was just a couple of kids at a card table in a waiting room. The families um, were desperately in need of these services. And so we started off there, but really now um, our nonprofit of 600 volunteers. Um, we serve more than 15,000 individuals every year. And we have six sites in New York, Providence, DC, Chicago, Baltimore, and Boston. And um, the organization has really come to embody this idea that healthcare, solutions in healthcare can be really enacted by people who are incredibly young, but incredibly tenacious and passionate about connecting families to these resources. And um, the reason that Precious Health resonated so dearly with me is that it enabled me for the very first time to actually go out and hear family stories. Hear from them why it was so difficult, what was preventing them from actually ensuring that their kids, that their parents were healthy. And um, one of the things that strikes me the most about the work that we do is that the infrastructure deficits are everywhere. So Andy spoke a little bit about social entrepreneurship um, serving to fill a need, right, in a very innovative way, in a way that no one's really thought to put in there before. Um, so just to give you an example of the places where we work, we're at a clinic on the south side of Chicago that serves 45,000 patients a year and has one social worker. Um, in Baltimore, where I worked um, as a volunteer for two years and then as a programs manager for one, um, we're at a clinic called La Carolina, which um, serves about 80% of the patient population speaks Spanish as their primary language. There, is, um, there are no bilingual social workers. There's one doctor that speaks Spanish, and there's a translator who works there three hours every week. Um, so the need is immense, right, because families are coming in and um, are looking desperately to their doctors for assistance around these issues, but essentially have nowhere to turn, nor do the doctors have anywhere to turn. Um, so Project Health seeks to actually address that infrastructure deficit by making it incredibly easy. So the way that we work in clinics is um, a family comes into the waiting room and they get their height taken, they get their weight taken, and they're actually also at that time administered a small five question questionnaire um, that says, very simple questions like, at the end of the month, do you have enough food at home? Um, are you interested in learning about job training opportunities? Um, do you find that your heat or electricity gets cut off in the middle of the month? And families fill it out. And then when they go into the doctor, um, into the actual exam room, the doctor, in addition to seeing their height, their weight, also sees whether they're in need of food or whether they're in need of childcare. Um, and the doctor actually has a conversation with the patient about these issues. Um, and then afterwards, if the client actually does say that they want some, some assistance around these issues, the doctor actually writes a prescription for food or writes a prescription for childcare, which the family then takes to our volunteers at the desk. And the cool thing about working with college volunteers, which, you get, which will resonate with you guys, is that we're not going to take no for an answer, right? Like, if you're a college student, you will Google everything and you will make sure that you have all of the information you need to get the family what they want. And uh, one of the reasons, you know, people have asked us over and over again, why college students as your workforce, right? They're young, they're inexperienced, um, you know, they, they don't really know how the system works. And that's exactly why we want to use college students, right? Because they are outsiders to the system. They're going to make sure that they break through any red tape or any bureaucracy um, to really find an innovative way to help the families, right? So one example is um, we had a client who came in to a desk that I was working at in Baltimore. And she said, you know, I have had um, two shootings in my neighborhood. Um, my child wakes up every day with an asthma, um, with an asthma attack because there's asbestos in her house. I really just want to move to a place that's safe and to a house that is um, healthy. And so, you know, we looked around and we called the housing assistance um, department and of course they were like, oh, we have no money, there's no housing, the wait list is five years long, it will never happen. Um, and then we called some other nonprofit organizations and they said, we'd love to help you, but we're so inundated already with requests that there's no way that this is ever going to happen. And then, you know, we also talked in the clinic, tried to get um, opinions from other families who were also facing the same issue, but again and again, came up against this answer that it was never going to happen. And um, I was working with another volunteer at the time, and she was like, well, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Like, there has to be a solution. There can't just be, we can't just stop and say, sorry, you know, it doesn't matter that you are um, you know, facing these terrible problems in your home, we're just not gonna be able to make any traction on it. 
So she and I um, Googled, we went and spoke with the housing commissioner, um, we went and spoke with, we had a, we actually brought um, some people from HUD, who I think you guys are speaking to someone from HUD as well. Um, we brought them to campus and told them the stories of the families, um, and they said, okay, well here's what we can do. Um, we can, if we look for ways to increase the expendable income of the family, right? So let's say the problem right now is that they can't afford an apartment that is $500 a month um, in a neighborhood that they'd like to move into. What can you guys do to make that happen, right? So that they're then able to use that money for the housing. Um, so basically by enrolling the family um, in a job training program, we got them connected to health insurance so they weren't spending outrageous amounts on emergency department bills every month. And then they were able to actually have the money that they needed to make rent. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't the standard answer. It wasn't, oh, just apply to the housing list and stay there for five years. It was actually what sort of creative problem solving can we um, actually employ to make sure that this problem is solved. Um, so, you know, for me, Project Health has really been an extraordinary experience just because um, it has been leadership. I was one of the first volunteers and had the opportunity to work with over 180 volunteers in the time that I was with um, the organization in Baltimore. It's obviously been my career trajectory. I mean, I've been with Project Health um, ever since I graduated and worked in Baltimore and now I'm working here in Boston as chief of staff. And um, it's also been really what has shaped my perspective on the world. So when I look at systems that everyone is saying are insolvable or are just too bureaucratic, my answer, the answer of the alumni that have come out of the program is no, that's not actually the case. There is some way that we can be innovative and actually solve around this problem. Um, so what I wanted to say briefly, um, just in terms of you know the things that I've really taken away from Project Health is, um, I know you guys have all been speaking to the question of ethical leadership, and um, I have really, really benefited from some great lessons around ethical leadership in the work that I've been doing with Project Health. Um, I work with Rebecca, our CEO, who um, has overseen the growth of this organization from just a tiny 10-person organization made up of college students to um, a 600-person, $11 million organization that we are today, yet she's never lost that perspective on, you know, we were these underdogs. We were really trying to make something out of nothing. And uh, even to this day, she, um, you know, she will really go out of her way to acknowledge everyone from the grassroots volunteers to our staff team to the clinic partners that we work with, the university partners that we work with, and um, she has been known to send them cakes. She has been known to, you know, really acknowledge the work that they do, which I have found to be just an incredibly valuable lesson about how you lead um, and how you lead through gratitude and how you really um, express your just you know, great appreciation for all of the advice and all of the work that people invest in you. And the, you know, Rebecca will say over and over again that um, that she really wouldn't have made. It, in Project Health at all were it not for the incredible mentors and advisors who were there for her every, every step of the way, giving her advice, telling her that she was crazy, or really encouraging her even when the idea was crazy. Um, many of those mentors um, were here at the university, but certainly mentors from the private sector, mentors from the public sector, from the hospitals. This network of advisors that you build for yourself can really be um, an incredible, incredible boon. And for me, when I was at Project Health Baltimore, even now um, in my career trajectory, when I have questions that I'm just grappling with, I can go to those mentors and they're always willing to give me some advice, right? And they are removed from the situation. They're not so emotionally invested in it and they're able to just give their straight out answer, which to me is, uh, is really invaluable. Um, the second thing I would just say is that, um, you know, when you are embarking on something that is seen as a little bit crazy, right, whether it's starting your own organization, whether it's pursuing a major or an interest that you really love but that other people aren't quite on board with, um, it always helps to have some partners in crime and uh, to have some people that you're working with who really believe in what you're doing. And I found that a lot of my partners in crime have actually come from uh, food programs like this one, where I was you know, in a community of people who were innovative, who were minded who were just incredibly smart. And whenever I had an idea that I wasn't sure was going to fly, I would bring it to them and they would say, 
that is totally weird. I would love to join you in developing that idea, right? And um, you know, I'm going to be there to laugh at you when it fails. But until then, you know, I will absolutely support you in everything that you're doing. And um, you know, for me, those have really those friends, those colleagues, those people who are just willing to take the leap with you are some of the best people <coughs> that you can find. So if you find them, hold on to them, and, and they're they're everywhere. They're not always at your school. Um, they're not always at home. They can be pretty much anywhere that you go. Um, so the last thing I'll just leave you guys with, and then I'd love to open it up to questions from you guys, um, is that you know this idea of social entrepreneurship is really um, it's not a new one. Right, that for many, many years, people have been applying private sector techniques for the good of the community. I think what is exciting about now is that our generation, um, as to be included in the generation, is really amped up about making the change happen through social entrepreneurship, through nonprofits, through volunteering, whatever it may be. I think that um, you know a lot has been made of Generation Z. I think we're Generation Z, something along those lines of them just really being so interconnected, of us you know, always having access to information at our fingertips, of being incredibly passionate um, because of the information that we have about helping others, right? Helping whether they're right there in our hometown or whether they're abroad, whether they're in Haiti, whether they're in, um, you know, in Louisiana, it doesn't matter. Our generation is just passionate about making things happen and making things happen for the good of others. And um, one thing that I have you know, just been incredibly grateful for in my life that I've been given the opportunity to serve and to give back to the communities that I've lived in um, and have a job doing it, right? And actually be like making some money doing it, which is important um, and which many people tend to overlook. But um, I think that organizations like social enterprises, like nonprofits, like government um, service, and even serving within a private company, because it's not true that all private companies or evil, there are certainly great things that you can accomplish with private sector resources. Um, I believe that you know, our generation really has the ability to take social entrepreneurship to the next level and imbue it into whatever activities, whatever jobs, whatever, um, whatever organizations that they begin to create and really just you know, impact the system with their view that actions should be undertaken for the good of others and, um, and that we can be effective in doing it, right? So that we're not just doing service or helping people for the sake of it, but actually being effective and instituting change as we do it. So um, I'll stop there, but I would love to hear your questions. And again, thank you guys so much for having me.
there are there's so many universities that are geared towards the medical field. You know, I was thinking about what comes beyond that. You know, and, and I had a great system. I had a, which is called a PACT mm. and uh, Children's Hospital and BMC. But it was always, well, you can help with medication. I don't know about the handicapped man. That's right. You know, I don't know about that medical bed. It's you know your deductible is not this and that. So I had to go, and it took me two years, and I found that organization. But I my first language is Spanish, but I see all the other parents in the hospitals who cannot communicate. That's false information. So that's the kind of I want to tap into that's the the niche that I'm going to tap into, and like I said, I'm very passionate about it. Thanks. So now uh, you're absolutely right. A key piece of this is just redefining what healthcare actually means, right? When when people think about health, they think about being sick, getting medication, and getting better, right? No one's thinking about all of the factors that come along with that. We have we have an alum who works um, at UC San Francisco, and she was saying, when my colleagues write a prescription, they think their job is done. Right? When I write a prescription, I'm thinking, can my patient read the prescription? Can they get to the pharmacy to pick up the prescription? Can they afford the prescription? Do they have food to take the prescription with? There are all of these other factors that impact um, how that medication is actually going to help the patient. And what you were saying um, is absolutely key, which is that the work that we do um, is we are not, you know, there are many nonprofits who will talk about helping others. That's not what we're looking to do. We're empowering our clients who already know about the system, right? They might not have all the information, they might not have the tools to navigate the information, but they're gonna know better than any college student is ever gonna know all of the resources that are available, how this is going to work for their particular family. And we try to work very much in partnership with families to bring their stories to the people who can make these changes, right? So there's a piece that is direct service, but there's also a huge piece that is advocacy, right? And taking the stories of the families that you're hearing, that you're learning, and bringing them to the people who actually have the power to reallocate funds or create a new policy. And um, we actually had the opportunity in Maryland to bring 10 of our families to testify on behalf of the health insurance expansion in Maryland. And the, the stories that these families told, it was incredible. The policymakers were like, oh, wow, I had no idea that that was actually going on, or I thought the system that we had was sufficient. I mean, it wasn't until you know the stories were identified and then these families were encouraged to actually come forth with their stories that some stuff actually started changing and that the landscape started shifting, right? So that policymakers understood what was going on. You also have the Accessibility, this is sustainability, right. health literacy, access, and the sustainability. You right. don't have time either. <coughs> right. Yeah, and um, and that's that's absolutely correct as well. That with a social enterprise, this issue of sustainability, you know, how do you actually um, have the resources to keep doing what you're doing? Um, is so is such a huge question for us. When we started, we relied on individual donations, we relied on local philanthropy grants from foundations. But over time, we realized that the only way that we can actually achieve systems change in the healthcare system is to have the healthcare system pay for what we're providing, right? So we have to actually be incorporated into the hospital's budgets so that they consider us not just some charity in the waiting room, but actually a part of how their hospital functions. And this is um, a goal that we have set that we're, you know, we know it'll take a long time to get there. Um, we've started having conversations with um, Health and Human Services in DC to figure out, you know, someday could Medicaid maybe reimburse hospitals for these services? Or someday would hospitals be willing to say, you know, we'll have a project health in every clinic if you guys are able to help our families with these needs? And, um, and we actually, you know, we've been fairly successful so far. So we'll continue to see, you know, in the clinics that need this program the most, money is not, you know, free falling, right? Money is incredibly um, restricted and incredibly restrained. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we can, you know, be sustainable and be creative about how we get our funding, but um, still work with the clinics that need us the most and that work the most with the populations. Um, expanding. Yes. Any 
that? Yes, good question. So um, we just completed a year-long strategic planning process, which is to say that we, you know, we've been growing since 1996. Um, we have these six sites in these big cities. And last year, we took we paused. We essentially said we're not going to grow through this year because we want to figure out why we're growing and to what purpose, right? To what goal um, is this growth actually going to take us? And so um, we just so the strategic planning process set out what are the key hypotheses that we as an organization want to prove about ourselves, right? So when people ask, do you actually improve health outcomes? We can say definitively yes. Or when they say you know, do you actually empower families to access these resources? We can say yes. And so the next four years are what we call our proof period. Um, it's very sort of um, businessy jargon, but what it essentially means is that over the next four years, we are going to be making refinements to our model. We're going to be hiring a ton. We're hiring like 50 new people over the next four years. So I'm putting that out there for all of you. <laughs> Um, and we are going to be uh, evaluating our programs. So we're really going to be evaluating them strictly um, with broad sort of cross-site evaluation. And the, the objective of all of that is to figure out you know, when we grow, when we decide to hugely scale across the country, we'll know exactly where we need to go and how quickly we need to get there to be able to solve our, you know, our eventual theory of change. Um, so I will say that our plan for right now is to grow to two new sites over the next two years. So very slow growth, but those two new sites will be for the purposes of, um, of proving our hypotheses. So until now, we've worked mainly in urban sites. So maybe our next um, site will be a rural site so we can see if the program model works there as well. Yeah. I was just wondering if there is a policy component to the organization. Given that well, in the last six months, so much has happened with immigration laws starting in Arizona. Yeah. Three weeks ago, something is, is trying to get through the city of Cambridge. Something. All these legislations that are aiming to uh, inhibit undocumented immigrants from yeah. public services. And obviously, policy can only exacerbate, bad policy can only exacerbate the situation that is already pretty bad for immigrants. So I'm just wondering what the organization is doing at a policy level so that healthcare becomes more accessible to everyone. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, at the clinic that I was mentioning before that we worked at in Baltimore, um, one of the questions that we came up against over and over again were um, with our families, um, with our immigrant families, how do we, like, where, are there even any resources available for them to access, right? Because there are such stringent eligibility requirements for families, um, you know, they have to prove citizenship like 10 different ways. You have to bring in like several pieces of paper, you have to show everything, every piece of identity documentation that you have. And um, so for us, yeah, the policy piece is um, exactly as I was alluding to before, when we go to HHS or when we go to HRSA, when we join the healthcare reform dialogue, our perspectives are always those of our clients, right? So the clients that we're seeing at this clinic we're saying, you know, I would love to apply for food stamps, but I can't because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a citizen. Or even those who were able to prove residency, they had to bring in every scrap of paper that they had ever had to prove their five years of residency, and um, it was just, it was, it was not feasible. So in Maryland, for example, um, after having client after client come in, wanting to, you know, often their kids were American citizens and they would want to at least get the child on health insurance. Um, in Maryland, they have this program called the CHIP program, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program. And any child um, you know, below a certain poverty level was eligible for the program. Um, but the parents were coming up, but the whole point of the expansion for the program was that if your kid was on health insurance, then you would also be eligible for health insurance. And the problem that these parents were facing is that over and over again, their applications would be rejected because you know, the government would say, you, you don't actually have eligibility for this. So we documented, um, at the clinic that we were at, we documented 250 cases of families who, under the legalese of the law, should have actually been granted health insurance by the state of Maryland. And you can imagine, it was, it was, um, it was a tricky landscape to navigate, right? Because a lot of these families didn't want their stories to be documented or didn't want their stories to be taken to government officials um, and shared. In, in such a way, and so we made sure everything was anonymous. We made sure that you know it was a ag 
aggregate cohort, we weren't singling out any families or anything like that. And we presented the cases um, to um, one of the state senators um, who held this issue very dearly to his heart. And he said, you know, this is absolutely unforgivable. And actually, about, you know, it took a while, but about three months later, um, they passed like a special exemption under the law so that those families could then apply for health insurance retrospectively. So there are small cases where it works. Obviously, it's very difficult. There are setbacks at every level as the debate continues. And it very much depends on what political climate you're in. But for us, if we see a small scale problem that we can address by sharing the stories of our clients and um, pursuing a policy agenda more aggressively, then we'll do it. And it helps to have the support of doctors. It helps to have the support of universities because the policy officials very much enjoy the support of those two constituents and will do whatever they need to do to make sure they're happy. Yes? Hi, I'm Rob Bidemont. I'm from the hey. University of California, Merced. And our university is located in a really poverty-stricken area in California, if not the nation. Yeah. And it's really brittle with drugs, it's low income, the education system is so far as well as the healthcare system. It sounds like a program such as Project Health would be a perfect fit for that area. And if we were to implement a program like that, what obstacles might we encounter and any suggestions on how we should overcome those obstacles? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I will say, speaking from experience, having to start up an organization in a city that um, that has sort of no end of problems, um, that one of the obstacles we came up against right away was, why should we be spending money on your initiative when there are 500 other initiatives that we already have in place that sort of seem to be working or maybe not working, but at least they're already there. We're not having to start something from scratch. And, um, and overcoming that obstacle was, uh, was hard because we were, again, we were college students. We didn't necessarily have a huge um, data or track record that we were running on. And what it took really was building a coalition. So I would suggest that any time you were thinking of starting a new organization, you reach out to any organization that's working in the same space as you or is going to be in sort of the same sector and start building partnerships because when people come to us and say, if you'd like to start a project health desk, one of the things we look for are, have they already started talking to the community resources available in their city? Have they already gotten partnership letters from the universities? Do they have buy-in from the hospitals? Because if you don't have physicians at your hospitals that are championing, championing this, it's going to be very difficult for this to actually happen. Um, and so, you know, those, though, and it can be very, relationship building is that often, um, sort of dramatized, but it's very simple. You just go in and you speak honestly about what you're trying to achieve. And you, of course, um, you know, you keep in mind that this organization is also working to their own mission, that they, you know, also have to make decisions about how they spend their money. But essentially say, you know, we are, we are doing this for the good of the community. We really think that it can be a community-led initiative, that it can be community-partnered. And, um, and those relationships will help you overcome obstacles because the word starts to spread. So soon, when you um, sit down with someone who could have been a reluctant audience a week ago, they'll say, oh yeah, you met with Sally. Like, I, I know Sally, I work with her all the time. She loves you guys, you're great. Um, and really, those relationships start to build on themselves. So I'd say that's certainly part of it. Um, and the other part is, um, is figuring out the transition piece. Right? So we are a college organization, and we have college leaders that you know, oversee our volunteers, but they graduate and they move on. And how do you make sure that you have a succession plan in place that really ensures that the quality of the program carries over from one year to another? Because I'm sure um, we've all been parts of organizations where a really dynamic leader leaves, and all of a sudden the organization is sort of in shambles. And for a college-led organization, it is very important to make sure that you gather all your information and onboard and train the upcoming leadership um, to, you know, to really be in place to step in and take over. Sure. One more question, everybody. Isn't she great? <laughs>